production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High, how a local printmaker imbues magical realism into her work. I don't want to just say I'm the Colombian artist and this is Latin American art. It's just my memories. See what goes into preserving centuries-old prints with the Columbus Museum of Art and the women of Trichetti rock out with us in the WOSU studio. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi everyone, welcome to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Quickle. Eliana Calisari was born and raised in Colombia, but has called Central Ohio home for the past 20 years. She recently gave us a peek inside her printmaking studio so we could learn more about her process and how she represents her heritage in her artwork, namely through images that reflect her love of nature, both real and magical. Here's her story. Well, I was born in uh, Medellin, Colombia, in South America. I went to fashion design school. So fast forward, I moved to the United States and I thought I'm going to study, after doing fashion design, I thought I'm going to study business and I went to Columbus State to study marketing. Oh, I've been in Columbus 27 years or so. I teach at Ohio Dominican University. I am the head of foundations and I also teach printmaking. See, like, it's easy to forget that you have to flip your images. I done that like like all the time. Printmaking is kind of an obscure art form. People don't know much about it. And so I just want people to know any printmaker or any artist, there is so much work and there is so much love in what we do. We just put our life there. We sit there for hours and hours. And I always say that printmaking, there is not in between. You either love it or you don't like it at all. You hate it. Because there is such a long process before you even see an image. There are many ways to print. Relief, intaglio, lithography, and seal screen. That's the, the traditional. I do mostly relief. I really like carving wood. So imagine that you're creating a stamp. That's basically it. Well, I think I can't leave behind my culture all the way. So I'm always inspired by things that I remember or that I miss and so the butterflies are um, they're like to me they're kind of magical and they're a symbol of magic and the truth is uh, Garcia Marquez, Gabriel Garcia Marquez uh, was a Colombian author and I love his books and there is a character in 100 Years of Solitude and it's a tiny character it's like two pages I think the story is that he is preceded by yellow butterflies so you know that he's coming or that he's around because you see, you know, like so many butterflies. It's a tiny character, but it's very uh, iconic back home. Like the yellow butterflies are Garcia Marquez. It's this idea of magic and magical realism. So that's where I first thought about it. Oh, the butterflies, yellow butterflies, home. And then I ran with it. So this is putting pressure on my silk and instead of a press, so I'm kind of acting as a press. I don't want to just say I'm the Colombian artist and this is Latin American art. It's just my memories. So there is a character, I mean many stories, but there is one called Madre Monte or uh, Mother Nature. And this is a woman that is seen, supposedly she walks around in the forest and she protects uh, nature and the forest. So she's kind of a half woman, half monster, and it's always depicted like this woman with all these animals and nature all around, and it's kind of supposed to be a scary woman. So I don't think my image is scary at all, but it's this idea of this woman that is kind of fading away in nature with the butterfly. So I'm combining all these things that I remember that I miss. 
I work from photographs usually, and wherever I go, I take a lot of pictures. I have been going to um, Antigua and Barbuda is an island. It was a Sunday morning and there was a, not a lot of traffic and there were two people riding bicycles. My husband likes to ride bicycles and it's just a regular Sunday morning. There is nothing amazing. There is no resort view. And I decided that this series are gonna, is gonna be called What the Honeymooners Don't See. For the paper, when I do color, I do multiple blocks. So each color is a block of wood. Relief is something that people can do on their own, but most processes you need a press. So this is why places like Phoenix Rising exist. So anytime I need a big press, that's what I use Phoenix. I go there. Columbus is a great place to be um, today, an immigrant artist. See more of Eliana's work by following her on Instagram. Meanwhile, if you want to learn more about the art of printmaking, or perhaps expand the skills you already have, check out the Phoenix Rising Printmaking Cooperative, where you could structure a class to work one-on-one -on -one with one of their members. Visit phoenixrisingprintmaking.com to learn more. Printmaking is one of the oldest art forms. We saw in our previous story that it's much like engraving or stamping. In the 16th century, Germany's Albrecht Dürer was considered one of the most influential Renaissance printmakers. In fact, some of his works exist right here in Columbus and are among 50 old master prints that the Columbus Museum of Art has selected for conservation. From alkaline water baths to the delicate removal of old mucky adhesives, we learned more about the techniques necessary to preserve the quality and appearance of these fragile, centuries-old works on paper. We are in Gallery 5, and we are surrounded by 24 of the old master prints that were conserved as part of our grant from Bank of America. I mean, you, you come to museums and you see everything looks wonderful and the works of art all seem, you know, in wonderful shape, but it takes a lot of time and a lot of resources to sustain your collection, to make sure your collection, the works that you're caring for for generations, are in the optimal shape they can be in. And we had this fantastic old master collection of prints, old master prints. And there were quite a number of these prints that we could never put on exhibition. We could never share them with the public. And so this grant allowed us to look at 50 prints from that collection and conserve them and get them in shape so they could be shared with the public. Uh, usually when you talk about old master prints, you're really talking about Renaissance and Baroque. So you're talking about sort of 15th through 18th century prints. We are looking at the Albrecht Dürer Melancholia, and you see on the screen a photograph of the before treatment image. Prints uh, from Dürer's period of 1600s would normally not show this degree of discoloration unless some uh, outside influence had uh, caused advanced acid degradation. Uh, other problems are less obvious to the untrained eye and they have more to do with ongoing acid degradation of the paper, the cellulose fibers. Um, and that can cause embrittlement to the paper and discoloration, which is visually disfiguring to the works and makes them unsuitable for exhibition. It also, more importantly, it can significantly uh, decrease their lifespan if those acids are not neutralized and removed from the paper. Now, what we saw on the computer screen was uh, the before treatment uh, condition. Uh, and this is the Durer print after treatment. And you see that the extent of reduction in discoloration is uh, considerable. Many of these works have never been exhibited at the museum because they weren't, you know, in the condition to be able to be shared. So this is a very exciting moment for us. The term conservation was applied to represent two distinctly different approaches to 
artworks. One is restoration and one is preservation. The goal of restoration is mainly appearance. The goal of preservation is making something last longer. So we draw a little from each of those, a little bit from restoration, a little bit from the goal of preservation, and that mix is what modern conservation is about. Paper, it's very interesting. It's actually a great pleasure to work on older pieces. Oftentimes, the older they are, the better quality materials that were used, and they actually hold up better over time. Paper has to have a, a cellulose source, and it can be wood. In the past, it was more commonly cotton and linen. We call these older papers rag papers because they were literally ground out of used rags. That produced a very high quality paper. It was almost pure cellulose. So old master prints can be treated and come back to almost what they would have originally looked like uh, to these beautiful 100% cotton cream colored rag papers. Moved to the 19th century, uh, that source of rags disappeared and so they began to use wood. Just like your newsprint turns dark brown when you leave it sitting on your table, well that's what happens to artworks that have wood pulp paper and uh, uh, fibers in the paper. You can actually give paper, works on paper, because the museum has a very extensive work on paper collection, you can give them baths. I mean, I can never imagine you could take a piece of, you know, and put it, submerge it in an alkaline bath, but you can. We're now in the alkaline pH range between, uh, it's approximately 8.5. It's interesting, the use of ultraviolet light in washing is uh, a very interesting thing because one of the things that damages paper the most is being exposed to too much light. But when we wash in alkaline water baths and we um, expose these papers under water to ultraviolet light, it has the opposite effect. We do try to glean as much information as possible prior to treatment so that we uh, know what we might come up against. In the case of the Vandevelde prints of the Four Seasons, Three of the prints were noticeably more degraded than the fourth. And what we discovered under the microscope is that the fiber content of three of those prints is different from the fourth. But we did have to treat the three that we discovered under binocular microscope um, were of mixed fiber content, containing some straw that gave it an overall darker brown tone and also caused it to degrade more rapidly. So we treated those separately from the fourth print, which was done on 100% cotton rag fiber paper. All of the prints came in with various old paper tapes, um, animal glue adhesive on the reverse. These are all common, and we try to remove those because they do eventually uh, cause um, localized acid discoloration. <music> We are in the uh, storage room uh, at the Columbus Museum of Art. These are the prints that uh, we need to rehouse. This is an Albert Durer, uh, so it probably was made around 1503, 1518, so quite old. You can see that uh, the various stages of acid burn happening. So this is Jane Austen era. This is social commentary of the era, so 1808 social commentary. So the condition is, it's, it's got the good quality rag paper. Uh, it has some local stains, uh, but it is stable as long as we get it out of its current slightly acidic mat. No conservation treatment to reduce adhesive stains is recommended because it would require wetting the paper so much that it might do more harm than good. They suggested not even trying to remove this, um, uh, the leftover glue here for the same reason. You don't want this one to get too wet. You're going to lose the value of the hand coloring. Uh, so this really just needs to be put into the better mat. So it's a good candidate for rehousing. Our goal really is to preserve these for the future. And 
If we don't step in and slow ongoing age-related degradation, their lifespan will be shortened. This really makes a difference. It makes an entire part of the collection open to our visitors that weren't, that wasn't available before. Some 21 newly conserved, rematted, and reframed prints by European old masters are now on view at the Columbus Museum of Art. A new look at old masters includes many prints from the Thomas Ewing French collection, which was the single largest print donation and bequest in the museum's history. Learn more about this exhibit by visiting columbusmuseum.org. This next story comes to us from our friends at Houston Public Media, who give us this tour inside the Manil Drawing Institute, which opened to the public last year. It's the first freestanding building in the United States dedicated to modern drawing. The unique building design also modulates that strong Texas daylight in a way that both illuminates and protects those delicate works on paper. Here's more. Drawings in many ways are a very personal way for a, a viewer to connect with an artist. But they're also an integral part of our experience as humans. Every culture has drawing as a part of it. We all draw and this is a building that celebrates that. The Manila Drawing Institute was founded at the end of 2007 to promote modern and contemporary drawing. It has created many exhibitions, it has published catalogs that have traveled around the world. And so now we inaugurate an actual physical space for that institute. And it's devoted to the acquisition, the study, the exhibition, conservation and storage of drawing. So it's very purpose-built architecture. The Drawing Institute is an interesting building type, um, both because of its focus on, on drawing and works on paper, but also its scale. It's 30,000 square feet, so it's, it's really somewhere between a house and a museum in terms of its size. You know, when we studied the campus, we also noticed there's a kind of um, liturgical quality about the building types. You know, certainly the Rothko Chapel and the Byzantine Chapel is a liturgical type. The Faven installation has this crypt-like quality. You know, this whole idea of sacred and domestic kind of came together in, the, in this building. We were sitting in a room that's got light sort of coming from every direction. I think that gives it a sense of time, the change in weather. I mean, there's a kind of connection to the outside that's very different here than a more typical museum. Because it's a space for work and scholars and conservation, each one of those programs has a different light need. So I think that's something that, that defines the Drawing Institute is the qualities of light and atmosphere that are very calibrated but um, have a quite a wide range that's from the museum institutional condition to a domestic setting. Paper is very fragile and sensitive to light. A drawing curators will tell you that the room for the paper has to have a, a light level of like five foot candles or less. So when you're outside in the Houston sun, it could be as high as 15,000 to 18,000 foot candles. So I think this whole procession of having a courtyard that is partially indoors and partially outdoors, working in concert with the trees, are ways to slowly help your eye adjust as you come in finally to the gallery that you don't feel like you're entering a dark room. So we inaugurate the building with an exhibition of drawings by Jasper Johns. They're drawn entirely from the Menil's permanent collection, promised gifts, and then seven loans from the artist himself. He's one of the greatest artists of our time. Also on view is a wall drawing by Ronnie Horn, created this year, so as contemporary as you can get, that is an eclectic group of aphorisms which are silk screened onto a wall. This is the first of a series of wall drawing commissions that we will have in this building. And then the third work on view in our main space is a sculpture by Ruth Asawa. And you might say, why, why have a sculpture in a building devoted to drawings? 
She used wire to create these amazing orbs that are suspended in space, and she always referred to that work as drawing in space. So here you have an artist who pushes the, the typical definition of a drawing as an original work of art on a paper support in an entirely new way. We're pushing the definition of drawing because this is a building that will really explore what a drawing is and what its potential could be. Our local music series continues tonight with a group whose members definitely make a statement in more ways than one. Wearing matching black jumpsuits and glittering gold sequin capes, the women of Trichetti share their style of garage rock that's infused with a social justice message. Here they are performing Off Her Meds. You can hear more from Trichetti at WOSU.org slash local tunes or by checking out their Facebook page. And if you know a local band you'd like to nominate for our series, drop us a note on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. That's our show. Thank you for watching. I'm Kate Quickle, and we'll see you back here next week with more great stories of Columbus creativity. I'm
to my sisters, a million women strong. Cut down a march on the White House lawn. They try to tell us we don't belong, but the God of Celia C. Peters, Film and Visual Art. I'm a science, math, theoretical, physics fiend. My art is bold, colorful, and geometric. It's science fiction. I love building characters and their worlds. I love the process of putting a story together visually, getting a polished film from raw materials. I'm inspired by the very diverse, very unpredictable Midwestern sensibility that lives in the arts community here. Ohio artists are notorious for being insanely innovative and they go for it in every conceivable way. I'm Celia C. Peters, film is my art, and there's no place I'd rather make it. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors, and viewers like you, thank you.